A second major principle I want to go over is, in my opinion, the number one concept, the number one drive of everything that is done in a propane rail terminal, and that's pressure differential. Pressure differential is measured essentially in two ways. It's measured in distance or it's measured in time. When you measure in distance, you're measuring in multiple locations. So, be in different, at different points. When you measure pressure differential by time, you're measuring at one point. And that distance in time may be just a matter of a few seconds or a few minutes. However long it is, it's kind of irrelevant. It, it only depends on what it is you're measuring and what information you want to gather. Pressure differential by distance relates to how your product is or is not going to flow. We move product from rail cars to the tanks by changing the pressure in the tanks and in the cars and we do that by moving vapor. We move, we load rail car or trucks, I mean to say, we load trucks primarily just by moving liquid from the tanks to the trucks. But pressure differential factors into that just the same as it does moving in from rail cars to tanks or moving from tank to tank. I have three compressors at my place. I have four storage tanks. I can manipulate my valves and I can use a compressor to move liquid from any one of my tanks to any of my other tanks as the need arises for either to balance my system or to do maintenance and it's all pressure differential. This also affects your valve performance, your internal valves, I'll, I'll touch on that. What's the difference between gallons per minute and closing flow rate? That's very important to know because the more you understand your system, how your system works, easier it is to troubleshoot, easier it is to help design your system or how to figure out how to keep your system as balanced as possible keep everything as smooth as possible and so we got to figure out our pressure differential and when we're talking about measuring in distance you have to decide a lot of guys are asked and it's a, it's a common thing it's like what kind of pressure differential do you run when you're offloading rail cars mm -hmm. Where are you measuring? That, that's the answer. You got to decide where are you measuring from. On your compressors, you have an inlet. Well, it's actually, I think they call it suction and discharge. Inlet, outlet, as far as we're concerned. You can measure from here to here at startup, at static, these two will be the same. And then when you engage your bypass valve or you engage your compressor, if you don't have a bypass valve, this will drop and this will raise. And then when this stabilizes and this stabilizes, you can look at that and say, well, that's my pressure differential. Well, that's accurate enough. I mean, that's a pressure differential. Does it tell the, the most accurate story as to what your difference is between your tanks and your cars? No, but maybe it's enough. Maybe that's all you really need to understand to see how your system works. Here's another thing about pressure differential. Use these gauges all the time. They will use gauges to troubleshoot your system. You start up in the morning and you're offloading a car and you start and this sucker goes from 80, which was static, and all of a sudden it drops to 60, 40, 
20, 10. And that means somewhere in your inlet supply from your tanks, something is closed or has closed. Same thing here. You start off, your static at 80, it climbs 100, 120, 140, 160, 180. That means somewhere from your compressor to your rail cars, you failed to open something. Or on the vapor side, you probably failed to open something. And on the liquid discharge lines, it means something might have slammed shut. So you will always look at this and then become familiar with your system. That's what I talked about earlier about walking around with your eyes open. Walk around with your ears open. Listen, become familiar with what everything sounds like in, in a normal setup when there's no problem. Just become familiar with it. And then when you see some things like you'll know that every day, you know, it's winter time, it's cold, or it's summertime and it's hot. I expect this to drop a certain amount and I expect this to raise a certain amount initially on initial startup. And that during the offload, this will probably continue to go up and this should probably stay stable. You figure that out and you watch it so that when something, anything out of the ordinary happens, you pick it up right away. Sooner you find it, sooner you fix it, the smaller your problem is. And it's not a good idea to say, well, you know what, my compressor has a high limit switch. And uh, eh, what the hell, worst comes to worst, it'll hit the high limit and the compressor will stop. Then I'll know there's a problem and then I'll go and I'll deal with it. That's one way to do it. But you're going to have a bigger problem, a bigger knot to untie. If that thing gets all the way up to 200 PSI and then kicks out your high limit, it's going to be you're going to have more problems to try to solve than it is if you would have caught it. 15 minutes earlier. So, pressure differential depends on where you measure it at. I would encourage you to have a lot of pressure gauges installed throughout your entire system. You're required by code to have one on the tank. You're, you know, by other things, then you're gonna have two of these. I have dozens of gauges spread throughout my property and all, all my piping. Like up at my towers, when I want to measure pressure differential as far as, you know, what are your compressors shoving in and what's coming out, you know, what's going in the cars, what's coming out. Because when you understand pressure differential, you realize your safeties have an operating range and you need to find their maximum limit so that you stay below it as you're offloading. When I had my original piping system, because I've since then, I've torn my piping system to the ground, redesigned it, and rebuilt it. It used to be with my old piping system, once I hit a 30-pound pressure differential, I was just about maxed out. If I got close to 40, I would start slamming uh, emergency valves. My safety valves would just start. And then, of course, when one car slams one valve, every other valve and every other car thinks it's their turn next, and they just do a domino effect, and then you got a mess. Well, my new piping system, I, I don't know what my limit is right now. I've taken it up and I consistently run a 50 pound pressure differential without an issue. I really don't want to push it much more than that, but learn it. And when it comes to installing valves, there's a certain principle to follow when it comes to installing a valve. One is always install a snubber and I'm going to step over here and I'm going to grab a couple things and I'm going to, I'm going to show you a couple things here. One, here's just a steel snubber. Nothing that special about it. It's got a little, uh, I think a number 54 drill orifice hole in it. Quarter inch male, quarter inch female. This particular one is made by Marshall. I highly recommend it. Very, very strong, very affordable. Uh, and then you have a snubber and then you have a needle valve. There's two kinds. One, there's a Marshall. There's a Marshall needle valve. They're like $10, I think, last time I bought one. They work. They all leak on me, 
you run these and you turn them off and on 10, 12 times, they leak right out of the packing. You tighten the packing and they still leak. I, I got one. Not sure why I keep it, but I got it. Uh, I buy these from gas equipment company. They are three times the price of a Marshall. They are ten times or more the quality of valve. These also have an issue of the packing wanting to back off every once in a while. You use it enough. What I do is I, and when I first buy valves, I get them. I back this packing nut all the way off, put two or three drops of blue Loctite, tighten it back down, and it is a lifetime trouble-free valve. I, I've never had to pull one out of my system because it was an uncontrollable leaker. But you put in a snubber into your system, that small hole eliminates or minimizes vibration. Put in a needle valve so that you can always change this. And then I buy these. This is a pretty standard one for me. It is a four inch diameter liquid filled zero to 300 pound. And I get it because of the gradation scale. It's pretty fine. It's about every two pounds. It's very helpful. It's very helpful so you don't want to be, when you're really trying to troubleshoot something, especially when we get into troubleshooting the inlet supply, whether you have pressure differential drop on your pump inlet supply or not, you want something that's got a little bit finer gauge. Ultimately, if you want the finer, the best gauge out there, buy a digital gauge when it's trouble, time for troubleshooting. Can't leave a digital gauge in your system because it runs off a battery, but it is just the way to go when you need to get accurate numbers. And then I just, um, you know, thread this in. Sometimes you put a Street L, you know, Schedule 80 Street L in there to change direction. But that's a pretty standard setup. Always have a snubber, always have a needle valve, always put that in so that you, um, eventually this is always going to go bad, eventually. For one reason or another, it's going to go bad. Shut off your needle valve, make your change, life is easy. All right, that said, up at my towers, I have a pressure gauge in my liquid pipes. And then I have a pressure gauge in my vapor ESV valve. I just look at the two. And as, I was, as I'm offloading, this shows the pressure being shoved into my car. This shows the pressure inside my liquid pipe as my liquid's being shoved out of the car. And then I look at my static, because I measure my pressure differential on my liquid by distance and time, but it's by time static pressure and then offload pressure and then that's how i do it you also can measure your pressure differential when you're offloading by taking your pressure reading at the car and then take a pressure reading at the tank wherever you choose to take your readings at Just keep in mind, it's pressure differential is what's going because it doesn't take that much gal. It doesn't take that much difference to get product to flow, but you need to keep your pressure <clears throat> as close. In my opinion, you need to keep your offload pressure differential as high as you can possibly get it and safely run it. Otherwise, you'll just drag your offload time out. You'll, it'll just take a long time. I did it, did it once, one summer. I had a car, came in, and it was like 20 pounds more pressure than what my tanks had because it was early morning. And I thought, you know what? I wonder how long this thing will run. I just want to try it out. So I opened it up. Liquid just ran immediately out of the car. It looked like it was really good flow, nice, steady flow. Checked it an hour later, still good flow. Hour and a half later, still good flow. Two hours later, still good flow. And I'm just barely coming up in the tanks. 
So finally, after two and a half hours, I couldn't take it anymore, and I started up a compressor. Took another 45 minutes running the compressor to finish emptying that car. Just because you're having flow doesn't mean you're having the flow that you want and you need. And that's why understanding your pressure differential. And so if this is your threshold, I try to run mine just as close up to that threshold as I can get before my safeties kick in. And you know, my ESVs slam shut. Just get up in there, just kind of ride the edge because uh, you keep it up there. And you have to decide what you're comfortable with. If you're not comfortable getting close, don't do it. All I'm saying is know your pressure differentials so that you know what, what your range of operation is and then you decide where your safety factor and your comfort factor is inside that, that range. And then, so of course, that's just a real quick overview on pressure differential when it comes to your compressors. The other pressure differential relates to your pumps. I run Corkin Z4500 pumps. That means they're a four inch inlet, three inch outlet. If you are running, say, a um, like a Clyde Union turbine pump, they are, I believe, six inch inlet and four inch outlet. And then the other ones, you know, three inch pump will be a three inch in, three inch out. Unless you have a pump that was specifically built to create its own differential pressure, and you know, like pump product from underground to above ground, that kind of a thing, your pump requires on a steady, constant inlet supply. And remember what I said earlier when we were talking in about the vapor, your, your vapor would be a certain density, and as soon as you start the compressor and you pull off of that, you lower the density of the product inside that piping as you change its pressure. We have the same thing we have to deal with on, on the liquid side. There's another term I want to deal with and it relates to the pumps because it's liquid. And that is the C word. Cavitation. Cavitation is always a result of pressure drop. That's why we need to know our pressure differential on our pumps. We want to avoid cavitation. Cavitation is directly tied to pressure drop. On our liquid pipe or inlet pipe, it's got a certain density. And so when your pumps kick in and they begin to pull off of that, we want a steady, constant, weighted supply always going in there at a greater volume than the pump can pull. And the greater the volume you can supply to it, the less pressure drop, the, the less pressure differential you'll have from, the, from your supply piping to your pump. If you have too much of a pressure differential, too much of a pressure drop in your liquid supply, when your pump kicks in, you're going to change the density of that liquid and you are going to allow the propane vapor that's suspended in the liquid to expand. We had the same opposite thing. We had vapor with the risk of liquid droplets of propane in it that caused trouble to our compressors. The opposite is true. We have liquid that has compressed tiny little vapor droplets in it. We don't want those vapor droplets to come in the form of cavitation and cause havoc with our pumps. So the way to minimize it, stop it, is to provide as much steady, constant, weighted volume into that supply pipe. You now you got to decide as part of your troubleshooting on your pumps, if you are having a cavitation issue, is what is the problem? What's causing my cavitation? On a 4500 pump, you're going to have a tap on the top, and I strongly recommend that you install and leave in 
your pump pressure gauges to, sh to always leave them in there to always monitor your inlet and outlet pressure on your pumps. So here you are, you got an outlet and you got your discharge and then you got your inlet. Then over here you got your piping system coming over and then somewhere in here you're going to have a strainer. Yeah, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Anyway, it's a strainer, you know what I mean, it's a strainer. What I do, and there's on this, this is a four inch on mine. That means right here's an inch and a quarter plug that comes from the factory. You pull that plug and you install a nipple and a one and a quarter inch ball valve. Then what I do is I, the plug on the outlet of my ball valve is a quarter, inch and a quarter by a quarter inch. So I have a quarter inch pipe female opening there in that, in that bushing, it's not a plug, it's a bushing that I can just leave a plug in it. But what it allows me to do is I can keep that valve shut off, I can pull that plug and I can thread in a pressure gauge. Because I want to see, if I'm curious, am I having a pressure drop from my strainer to my pump, I'll have a gauge here. And so static, pressure, nothing running, this gauge and this gauge should read the same. Now here it comes, we're going to start the pump, this thing's going to kick up. How much of a drop do we have? We're going to measure our pressure differential in time right here. You want very, very, very little pressure drop right there. I mean we're talking just a few pounds at most. If you're having, if you got a seven, eight, ten pound pressure drop from the time the pump kicks in and this thing drops, or you notice another big, you know, that means that's telling you that it's probably supply, or it's also possible your screen inside here is plugged up, something else to diagnose. But you want to also see what's the difference between these two in distance when this pump is running. There's information you can glean from that. And that's why I leave that. So these only stay in when I'm diagnosing a problem. Otherwise I leave them plugged. And another advantage I have is when I leave this plug in the shutoff valve, if I ever need to drain all the liquid out of this line and this pump, I just pull that quarter inch plug, put in a 3 8 rubber hose, run it over here to a hundred pound cylinder, open it up, and I can drain from my shutoff valve here, I can drain all of this piping right into a hundred pound cylinder, then all I have left to do is vent off the propane vapor. Then I can use that one hundred pound cylinder when I'm all completely done, have all my repairs or whatever done, use that 100 pound cylinder, open up the service valve, shove propane vapor back into my system and pressure this system up with propane vapor because as you know or you should know or you never pressure a piping system up with liquid propane. Always, always, as long as you have that option, always pressure this up with propane vapor, not liquid. Because Liquid's just going to boil and boil and boil, it's going to create pockets, going to create trouble. Just pressure it all up with vapor. Besides, if you have a leak, it's easier to drain vapor than it is to drain off any accumulated liquid in your pipe. Also, when you are using and you want to set your bypass, so here we are, we've got a bypass valve. Two common mistakes that we all make is we set our bypass pressure too low or too high. Don't ever count on the built-in bypass in your pump to save this pump from destroying itself if there were to be a problem. All it's going to do is it's going to shoot back and let it kind of recirculate, but it's got to have some place to go, and that's why we have a bypass valve. And so you measure pressure differential by time. And so you'll take your bypass valve, depending on your make and model and all that other stuff, but on mine, 
take the cap off, you take the adjusting bolt, back it all the way off. Make sure your hoses are turned off, closed off, so that when your pump runs, it's forced to go back up into your bypass line. So we'll start, and you'll take your static. You start off with static pressure, and then you go to pump pressure. You have, you'll, as far as I know, as far as I'm concerned, there's no right, best differential pressure to set. It depends on your system, on your piping, what your needs are. Some guys run successfully at like a 40, 45 pound differential pressure before their bypass opens. Mine's in the 70 pound range. And so what I do is, let's say static is 90 pounds of pressure. I want 70 pounds of differential. So I'm going to take this pump, start it. Then I'm going to go to my bypass valve and I'm going to start screwing in that adjusting bolt. You just keep screwing it in and you watch this gauge. And it's going to start creeping up. It's going to start going up. And when I hit my target, which 70 pound pressure differential means I want to be at 160 pounds. You can stop, take the backup nut, thread it down, snug it up, shut your pump off. Let everything settle down for a couple minutes, start it up again. You should really quickly, almost immediately jump to that 70 pound pressure differential or whatever this is and stay there. If it does, you're done. And that way you set each individual pump's own bypass valve. And if you want your pumps to pump in sequence, you want them to pump in, in together, you can match them all to the same. Just get them all set, each individual one. Because uh, I have two pumps tied together feeding one hose, and I got two more pumps tied together feeding one more hose. So to get them to be in balance with each other, I set each individual bypass by themselves so that together one's not going to massively overpower the other pump. Uh, pressure differential measured in distance, measured in time. Figure out your system, learn your system, apply this and this will help you not only operate and run your system but it will help you to diagnose and troubleshoot. Now one other major thing I want to address. And that is pressure differential when it comes to your valves. Whether that be an emergency shutoff valve or whether it be an internal valve. We are sold, all of these are sold to us and recommended to us in their gallons per minute. That tells us a lot of information, but it doesn't necessarily tell us all the information or the information that we really need to make a better informed choice. What we also need to learn and look up, you have to look it up, is, let's try another collar, contrast it out. Closing flow rate. That is a direct manifestation of pressure differential inside that valve. <laughs> None of these valves has a meter attached to it. That thing doesn't sit around and start counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 until it hits 500 gallons a minute. It don't know nothing. The only thing in there that is any kind of a brain in an ESV or an internal valve is the spring.
or springs, whatever, however it's set up, the strength of that spring determines its resistance to closing flow rate. That's what really we need to keep in. ESV's uh, excess flow valves, same thing. A, a, an ESV is a fancier version of an excess flow valve, and an ESV and an internal valve is also an excess flow valve that you can control with an actuator. And it's also got a um, fusible element inside of it. And that's about the only real difference between an excess flow valve and an internal valve or any of these others. It's just they have more safety features. But it's the same thing, it's just a spring. And how stiff that spring is, is how well it resists closing flow rate. We're sold GPM. Let's say you have, I'll take one of mine, I got a Z4500 pump. And you get looking at its capabilities, what that pump can do. And let's say that pump is rated to where Corkin says that pump, based on certain input data, all this other stuff, can do 370 gallons per minute on the outlet discharge side. And so you sit around and say, well, if I feed that with a 500 gallon per minute internal valve, I got C's and D's in math. Even I know 500 is bigger than 370, I should be fine. Maybe you will be. Maybe you won't because this 500 gallons per minute is based on a lot of things, but it's all predicated upon, it doesn't mean that this thing's gonna flow without issue the first 500 gallons in that minute. No, this thing doesn't know. That spring doesn't know gallons per minute. It spring knows closing flow rate. If you take a typical three inch Marshall internal valve. The closing flow rate for a 500 gallon per minute three inch internal service valve closing flow rate is 7 psi. That means if you have a pressure drop of more than 7 pounds of pressure you're done. Slam shut. Well, riddle me this, Batman. When are you likely to have a radical initial drop? Probably going to be on startup. So you've got this, and this thing is a four inch inlet. And if you're trying to pull it out of a three inch internal valve, you have to upsize your pipe right there as a restriction. And so when you pull, you may indeed come really close to tripping that initially. Maybe you won't. Maybe you will. But it's a good thing to keep in mind as you try to balance and design your system or go and troubleshoot your system. Don't fall for the siren song of saying, well, 500 GPM? Well, gosh, that can't be the problem because it's 500 GPM. Well, it may not be the problem, but it also may be the problem because we're, your real issue is trying to determine closing flow rate. I have, um, when I redid my system a while back, I added three four inch Marshall internal valves. One was, uh, 650 declared GPM. Two of them were 850 GPM. The same Marshall valve is, let me find it here, uh, NE994F. 
dash four F is in Frank. You can buy this with an operating range of 375 GPM all the way up to a Godzilla size 500 GPM. If you need high volume, there you go. Well, what's the closing flow rate on these? Sometimes we say, well, I want the bigger the better. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm better off going closer to 1500 GPM than I am going closer to 375. Well, there's just questions you got to ask and you got to think it out. Closing flow rate. The closing flow rate, as declared in Marshall's little chart, to make this thing shut requires a pressure drop of 1.5 pounds. To make this 1500 gallon a minute slam shut, you need a closing flow rate of 14 pounds. And you got to decide, you got to weigh your needs against your safety factor and your needs of balancing all of your equipment so that all of your tanks and everything is, is you know, properly feed your pumps, but your tanks also offload at a nice even rate. That is a huge amount of pressure drop. If you were to have a flex pipe partially ruptured, would you drop that section of piping from the rupture to this internal valve enough? How bad of a rupture must it be to drop that pressure inside that pipe beyond 14 pounds of a pressure differential? I don't know. But I know it's a higher risk at 14 than it is at 1.5. Well, only certain circumstances do you want a 375. You probably want something closer on up. So that's why I made my decision to, ba to, to balance my tanks out at 650 gallons per minute and 850 gallons per minute. So the closing flow rate, which is what I use to determine which one of these and where I would put them, is that for the 650, my closing flow rate is 2.5, well that looks like 25 pounds, it's 2.5, 2.5 pounds. My 850 closing flow rate is 4 pounds. That's sensitive, but when I installed these with my existing other internal valves, that put all of all each tank flows out going to the pumps at virtually the same gallons per minute, same closing flow rate across the board. So they're all nice and evenly balanced. And if I were to have a catastrophic failure or a semi-catastrophic failure um, at a flex pipe, I'm more likely to slam shut at four pounds than I am to shut off at 12 or 14, in my opinion. So that's why I made that decision. It's just something for you to consider. And it also help you simply because if you are slamming internal valves, it could be your spring is just shot. It could also be that you've got too many, too many other changes because it's possible you're, uh, there's a lot of things that are possible, but the only way to try to diagnose it is know what your system is designed to do, understand pressure differential, try not to be, take this for the information that it is, but understand it's not the end all of information. Closing flow rate will give you a much better understanding. See what your system is, look up your charts, see what they all are rated for. And Hopefully this rant will help you understand a little bit better of how things operate. One last thing I want to touch on is I use a Marshall, it's called an Accelerator High Flow Rail Car ESV. 
It is, uh, you look it up, go ahead and you look it up in the Marshall. There, it's, uh, the ESV's about this long, about that big around. They come in different GPMs. I went with the one that is 500 GPM. So, so it's 500 GPM. It's a two inch, that is two inch pipe in and out. You take a look up here, we got a typical Marshall three inch, 500 gallon per minute, three inch, three inch in, three inch out, internal service valve. Takes seven pounds of pressure drop before it'll slam shut. This 500 gallon per minute from Marshall has a closing flow rate of 14.25 pounds, which is exactly why I picked that version in this manufacturer, because I am offloading I already know, anticipate, and want fast, you know, fast, smooth, controlled flow coming out of my cars. I already know, I'm always, always, always going to have big pressure differential. As I'm shoving into that car and pulling out of that car, so I intentionally wanted a valve that had a high pressure differential, gave me good flow. It, it's been an excellent choice for me. Some guys use a Snappy Joe, which Snappy Joe is a Fisher name, but Fisher lost the contract, so uh, Rego makes a Snappy Joe version. They're a different thing, different setup. Um, I, I just personally don't like their flow rates. I don't like the other. I don't like their design I, uh, for this. I like their design for other things, but this is why I did it. So I can get a two inch emergency shutoff valve running 500, it says GPM, but I can run a 14.25 pressure differential. Gives me great flow, great control, and it provides a, to me, a good level of protection. So that's how I made my decision. So hopefully you can use this and I hope it was a positive, but if it's all this information is just a negative and you realize, oh my God, this guy is stupid with four O's, um, then you at least know you don't have to do what I recommend. But this is just my recommendation. I hope it helps. I hope it, you can add it to the rest of the things that you know and learn. Hopefully it may, may fill in some gaps for you. So thank you.